For many dancers in South Africa, this is where it all begins, at the ballet school of the University of Cape Town. In these studios in Rosebank, they acquire the discipline and dedication they will need for a career in this most demanding of art forms. This is where they learn to live a life in leotards, tights and point shoes. For some of them, indeed for most of them, it may also end here, with their dreams fading in the face of a lack of talent perhaps, or a lack of opportunity. But for a number of these young dancers, the ballet school does lead to a career on the stage, either here in the Cape Hat Ballet Company, in other South African companies, or indeed overseas. And then there are the very few who actually go on to achieve the sort of success virtually undreamt of by most of their colleagues. One of them is Harold King. As director of the London City Ballet, Harold King thought it might be to their advantage to have a royal patron. I thought, now, how do I do this? And I thought, well, obviously, Buckingham Palace. And I picked up the telephone directory, and B, it's there, under B, and I phoned Buckingham Palace, and I explained what I wanted to do. And they said, hang on a minute, we'll put you through to the Princess of Wales office. So they put me through to the office, and. Um, I sort of went on saying, it's a new young ballet company, we want a royal patron. Um, and they said, put it all in writing. So I wrote off, and then I had a letter back saying, terribly sorry, the princess cannot come and see any of your performances. Her evenings are completely chock-a-block for six months. And I thought, well, I'm not going to sit around here waiting for six months. There must be another way. So I thought, well, if her evenings are full, what does she do during the day? So, <laughs> so I, wrote, I wrote a letter saying, um, would she like to perhaps to come in and watch class and rehearsal. And I had a letter back saying she'd love to. Uh, but unofficially, no press, nobody's to know about it. We have to keep stumm. Not a word. So this was very difficult. But she came in, and we were rehearsing now. Thank God we left the church hall. And we were, <laughs> we were working in a studio um, in Covent Garden. I was worried because the biggest studio was the top of the building, four flights up, and no lift and no escalator. And so I met um, the princess downstairs, and I said, we're on the fourth floor. She said, no problem, lead the way. And she came upstairs, and I forgot to warn her, there was a step into the studio, and she fell into the studio. And um, <laughs> then, we, then sort of we went and we sat down, and she just sat and watched the class. And at the end of the class, she said, do you think I could get up, and all the dancers sitting all around the room, could I go and talk to them? So I said, of course you can. So she got up and she went around and she squatted on the floor and she chatted and she was just so natural and so wonderful and so keen on hearing all their problems and watching them put on their point shoes and asking questions and the dancers absolutely adored her and she absolutely adored the dancers. Um, she stayed until one o'clock. Oh, by the way, we also gave her coffee and we were terrified because we didn't have any porcelain. We only had paper mugs. No problem. She was happy with the paper mug. Um, and then she left at one o'clock and then sometime after that, like a couple of weeks after that, we had a thank you letter saying how much she'd enjoyed the morning and that she and Prince Charles were flying to Canada and if we still wanted her to be patron, she'd gladly accept and that Buckingham Palace would make the announcement on the princess's return from Canada, if we still want her. So, of course, I mean, <laughs> we, um, we immediately said, yes, please, and, and she came back and Buckingham Palace announced to the press and all the other ballet companies were green with envy. It was wonderful. Since then, I mean, she's done a tremendous amount for us. She has been absolutely wonderful. The London City Ballet Company is now 10 years old and has a repertoire which includes both the classics and new ballets, like this production of Carmen, with Harold King's own choreography. At first, in an attempt to make the company a viable proposition, at a time when other ballet companies were closing down, Harold approached the British Arts Council for a grant unsuccessfully. So he registered the company as a charity, appointed a board of trustees and found sponsors and that royal patron, of course. All of this enabled him to put on seasons of sellout successes, 
and to tour abroad on a regular basis. He draws dancers from all over the world, including South Africa. I wondered if this might present him with any problems. Yes, we have had problems with South African dancers um, in that we have four in the company. And when we were going to Jordan, um, the, the British Council were actually promoting the tour. And we were told, uh, we were asked whether we had South Africans. And our administrator, Heather Knight, said, yes, yes, we have four South Africans. And they said, well, um, you're not going to be able to go. You're not going to be able to take them. And um, I said to Heather, I said, but we have to have our South Africans with us. We can't perform without them. And she said, well, the, Brit the British Council say they won't be allowed into Jordan. So I thought, well, no, this is ridiculous. And Queen Nur, that's King Hussein's wife, is the patron of the, the Jarash Festival. Um, so I, went phone, I telephoned the Jordanian Embassy in London, and I asked whether the palace in Amman had um, a telex number, and they said yes. And I telexed Queen Nur, and I said, we have, we are, we're so grateful that you've in, in, and so honored that you've invited us to perform at your festival. However, we have four South Africans in the company. Um, and one of them happens to be a colored South African. Um, and you know, is there any chance that, that you'd allow them in? Because if you don't, we, we cannot perform. And then we had a telex back saying, no problem, go to the Jordanian embassy, take their passports, and they'll be issued visas, and, which happened. And we got in, and of course, the passport officials at, at the airport had never seen a South African passport before. So they were all clustered around their South African passports, studying them, wondering what on earth they were. So that was, that was all right, it was no problem. But I do think it's terribly unfair that, you know, that there is this um, um, thing all the time that we encounter with the South Africans. But nevertheless, I mean, it, it, no, no problem is insurmountable. And um, so far, you know, it's a little struggle, but, but you know, it's OK. Uh, how does one get around the problem of work permits? Well, again, I've been very lucky, but I suspect a lot has to do with that. I have a very good friend, um, a lady who works with um, overseas department with the British Actors' Equity, which is the, the dancers' union. Um, and when you, when you apply for a work permit, um, it, either you go through the Home Office or you go through the Department of Employment, depending on whether the dancer is actually in the country or out of the country. can't remember which way around it is, but you have to go to either one of them. But whichever, depart whichever one you go to, either the Home Office or the Department of Employment, they will always refer to the dancers' union. They will always refer to equity. And if equity have no objections to the dancer working there, then usually that's all right. And this has been the case. And this wonderful lady, I, I always telephone her and I say, look, I'm having terrible problems finding British dancers. And there's this marvelous South African. And um, we have to have him or you know, her. And um, you know, you're going to be approached by the Home Office. Or please, please, please um, say yes, say yes. And she always does. And so consequently, every work permit that I've applied for, I've got. And not just, I mean, I also have problems getting Americans um, work. And again, I have to go through the same thing of phoning my lovely lady and saying, please, you know, there's an American dancer. So, so far, so good. I have never had a work permit turned down. What does the London City Ballet look like at the moment? What is your full working complement? 32 dancers. But I must add that Merle Park, Dame Merle Park, um, ex Rhodesian, who is now the director of the Royal Ballet School, has been absolutely wonderful. Um, I telephoned her some time ago and I said that we, were, we, had, we don't have a school, a feeder school of our own. And I said that I wanted some young dancers to learn our repertoire for when we have injuries. We need someone to where we can t pick up a telephone and say, look, can you please send up a student because we have an injury? And Mel said, fine, I, I'd like our students to learn your repertoire. It's good for them, good experience for them. So, so Mel Park sent in, I went into audition students, and then Mel sent them along, and they started learning our repertoire. And so now we have this marvelous affiliation with the Royal Ballet School. Um, and like in June this year, we're going to Japan to perform on the biggest stages I've ever seen in my life. I mean, the stage in Osaka is to be believed. It, probably not as deep as your Nicka Milan theatre, but certainly double the width, double the width, vast. And we, we tour with 18 swans. Well, we tour with 12 swans or 18 swans, and now it's going to be 24 swans. So again, Mill Park will send along you know, these students, and, and we will increase the core. So it's rather nice having this affiliation with the Royal Ballet School, 
where we can actually, you know, um, increase the size of the company. So as I say, so 32 uh, basic dancers, then um, nine or ten girls from the Royal Ballet School when we need them. Um, we have three girls working in the wardrobe department. We have um, a technical crew, which is a technical director, a stage manager, and an electrician, stage electrician, three of them, that's our, our technical crew. Um, we have an administration in the office. We have uh, probably nine, I think it's nine or ten, working in the office. That's publicity um, and secretaries and um, administrator and um, an accountant. And we also have an education unit where um, some of our dancers do education work. And that's all sponsored by BP, British Petroleum. And um, so we have an education officer. She actually is in our office as well. Um, I, mean, I believe it's very important for us to do education work and build up audiences for the future. So lecture demonstrations and going into schools and inviting schools to come to theatres and, and all this sort of thing. Um, then we have two ballet masters who give class and take rehearsals. We also, t we also have a lot of guest teachers in because um, I think it's very important to have teachers to inspire and, I mean, the dancers do, after a time, get bored with, you know, one day one teacher, one day another, just going between the two. It's nice to have sort of fresh inspiration, so we invite a lot of guest teachers in. We've just had Pamela Crimes from Cape Town as a guest teacher. Um, we, have a, uh, we have three conductors. Um, one of them is actually also musical director. Um, he, he worries about, you know, orchestrations and, or finding people to orchestrate music, and he does all the paperwork as well. And now we have an orchestra. Our, our, our basic orchestra is 20 musicians, but then we increase depending on the size of the orchestra pit. So like if we're performing at Sadler's Wells Theatre, we have an orchestra of 50, and, you know, so... But still, there are four weeks of the year where we, t we go to the very small places. We take ballet to very small places, and we split the company in half. And half go probably back to Bexilon C, and half will go somewhere else. And there's no way that we could hire two orchestras. And in any case, these small theatres don't have orchestra pits. And the musicians' union jump on us every time we say, and say, we, we mustn't do this. We are not allowed to perform to tape. And so we say, well, they don't have any orchestra pits. And they say, well, then don't go there. And then I say, but why should these places be deprived of classical ballet? And they're very, very unreasonable. So they usually have to be placated with a lunch. Our chairman usually takes them out to lunch and says, now, come on, chaps, be reasonable. And eventually we get rounded, you know. But like when, we, when we, I go back to London now, uh, we've got some performances lined up. And the, we, one place we're going to is, is Colchester, which, again, is a very small auditorium. And the only way we could get our orchestra in there is to take out seats, to actually remove seats from the auditorium. If we take out seats, we, it doesn't actually make financial sense. We, we need those seats. We need to fill with, 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 with audience. So um, we've got this battle going on now, which we'll have to get over when we get back. They're sort of breathing heavily down our necks. On a personal note, what is it that has driven you to attempt the impossible and achieve such spectacular results? Well, um, I'm ambitious. And I really do believe that everybody, no matter who they are, everybody is approachable. If you approach them in the right way, and, and if you really believe in what you're doing, and if you believe that your product is something worthwhile um, persevering with, and, and if you can get other people to see it from your point of view, I don't think that there are any problems. I don't feel that there should be anything that should hold me back from making London City Ballet something very, very special. And I like to talk people into believing what I believe. And I find that stimulating and challenging. And um, to date, I mean, like with the princess, with, with everything that I've done, um, because I never sort of feel it's, it's impossible, it can't be done, I always believe it is possible and it can be done. And there are ways of getting through to people. And there are ways of making people see things from, from, from your point of view. So. I guess I just enjoy um, doing what I'm doing so much that I can't really believe that, that people would stand in my way and, 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 and cause me problems and put obstacles in my way. I, I, I think I probably just believe so much in what I'm doing 
And I think that kind of helps.